My name's Nadia Cameron. I'm the publisher and editor of CMO Australia. Uh, and I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon for our final stream session uh, this afternoon on survival as a business, cannibalizing your own business model. So we've got some great speakers for you this afternoon. Um, so kicking us off will be a presentation and then we're going to go into a panel discussion which I'll be moderating. Uh, so without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, our first presenter for this afternoon's stream. And that's Simon Kant, who is the co-founder and managing partner of reInventure. Founded in 2013, reInventure is a corporate reInventure fund with $150 million under management, bringing the best of independent venture capital and corporate venturing uh, with Westpac as the primary investor. Uh, so uh, to date, um, the corporate reInventure funds portfolio has more than 20 ventures, uh, which are focused on fintech and adjacent areas. Uh, Simon's got a great history. He's also founded and was inaugural president of Fintech Australia, the industry's peak representative body, where he remains a board member. And he's built his career in venture and innovation, including teams at Westpac, NAB, Suncorp, Fairfax News, APN, Tennis Australia. And he's also a founding team member at Social Ventures Australia. Please join me in welcoming Simon to the stage. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, give you a little bit of a, an insight, I guess, into uh, how the, the reInventure Fund came about as a, as a response to disruption in financial services. Um, and one of the core differences to the, to the, the approach there um, relative to a whole lot of other approaches where corporates had, have done venture funds um, is really in relation to its origins. Uh, and the key there is that back in 2013, um, my partner and I, who'd met um, at APN News and Media, which was a company on a very steep nosedive into disruption, um, we, we went there and tried to put together a, a strategy as a hedge against disruption there. But as we learned, um, and as is also very evident in a lot of the kind of economics of disruption, um, once a company is in that kind of a nosedive, it's actually almost impossible to come up with a real genuine remedy for disruption. Instead, what you go through is the kind of what, they, what Christensen, one of the sort of fathers of disruption theory, calls the death spiral. Um, and it's a little bit like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of dying. So denial, anger, rage, bargaining, all sorts of other approaches to disruption, none of which are actually going to stop it. Um, they're all about coming to terms with it. So um, that was where we'd come out of. So experiencing disruption in the media industry and, and you know, what we looked for was where is uh, a, an industry that actually has some real runway um, before disruption bites where we could actually potentially make a difference. And financial services was kind of the obvious one because disruption has kind of gone through in waves. So we ended up having the opportunity to pitch to Brian Hartzer, who wasn't CEO at the time. He was sitting in a kind of... Um, pre-CEO chair at the time, um, and he was one of the few executives who really got the thesis. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of that thesis, and it, it give you some insight into, I guess, how we think about how do you respond to disruption. So first thing to bear in mind is that it's actually very unusual to find incumbent leaders that are even prepared to acknowledge that disruption might happen. The history of denial and disruption is, is long and rich. And here are some of the examples. So, you know, Steve Barmer in 2007, no, um, it's never going to get any, the iPhone will never get any market share. We've got um, the CEO of Blockbuster, Redbox and Netflix aren't even um, on the radar screen. Well, that was unfortunate. Um, Digital Equipment Corporation, as far ago as 1977, there's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Well, that's possibly true once they've got them in their pockets, but I don't think that's what he was thinking at the time. Um, and of course, you know, the recent version of that, which may prove out to have similar sort of historic uh, implications, there will be no real non-controlled currency in the world by Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan. Um, and that was just a couple of years ago. So there's a long, rich history of kind of disruption denial. Um, but the reality is that disruption actually has a massive effect on industry. So this is what disruption did to the music industry. So at its peak in 2000, the heyday, 
um, it was at about 20 billion um, in sort of real dollar terms, and it's headed down down towards 6 billion and continuing to drop. So that's you know literally slashed the revenues of the industry by a third. If you look at the newspaper industry, it's not that different. At its peak again around 2000, it was at 70 billion, slashed it by even more than a third. It's now heading down to 20 billion globally. So it really does collapse industries. And this is the core of disruption. You know, people think about disruption as transformative experiences and all sorts of other things. But in terms of economics, this is what disruption plays out as. It turns out as companies that were once giants becoming absolute minnows. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory of it, which comes from Clayton Christensen. Um, there are three key features of disruption that he looks at, one of which is the customer. The key one is the customer segments that are being addressed. And he talks about disruptions are typically addressing low-end customers or people who can't even afford the product at all, so non-customers. Um, and the disruptor typically has a business model that it can actually serve those low-end customers or non-customers profitably, where the incumbents couldn't. And then the third thing that it has is a technology that enables it to extend that product upmarket over time um, in order to move from the low to the high end of the market. So how does that play out in, <coughs> in, a, in I guess, more practical terms. So this is a diagram that he talks about quite a bit, and it, it talks about the two distinct types of innovation. So the first kind of innovation is what incumbents do. It's called sustaining innovation. It sustains their existing business. And, and you can see this chart. It's just about product performance over time. Over time, a product improves in performance. Pretty simple. Um, and incumbents almost always win at um, sustaining innovation. Um, and they win because they've got everything to lose and they've got more resources than anybody else, so why wouldn't they win? And they typically do win. Um, so a classic example, and, but, but this is, starts to show where disruption kicks in. So the reason why disruption is, becomes possible is because the rate at which users can absorb or make use of those improvements is slower than the rate at which the improvement actually goes. Okay? So to make that practical, Back in the beginning of the PC industry, but let's, that's an Apple II, you know, typists would use that, and they'd still have to wait at times for the computer to catch up with their typing. It was that slow. This is the equivalent Apple in dollar terms um, in around about 2017. And that computer was used to produce Toy Story. It was used to produce Nemo. There may be typists who are still typing on that, but there is so much power in that machine that they don't use that it's largely for a lot of people who just use you know, a computer for basic tasks, it's completely overshot their needs. Does that make sense? So it's gone from the bottom of the market to the high end of the market, and it's now overshot everybody's needs. That's where we say incumbents overserve the mainstream. And that creates the opportunities for disruptors. So at a certain point, when that PC became more than we needed, disappeared which is basically a PC in our pocket that does 90% of what we want to do most of the time, and it's small enough that we can do it on the go. So it's both cheaper and far more accessible. Accessible because I don't have to pick that giant computer up and try and fit it into my breast pocket. I can just put my phone in instead. Okay? And 90% of what I do, email, browsing, etc., it now does... I was reviewing my PowerPoint presentation on this before I got up, so interestingly, it started for just email and, and browsing, but over time, Disruptors do exactly the same thing as incumbents, which is they go through their own sustaining innovation cycle. They improve the product, and as they do, it starts to eat the incumbents' market out from the bottom up. Okay, And that's what's happened. I now am using my PowerPoint on my phone. I don't need my laptop at all anymore. Right? So that's the, that's the, the process of disruption. And what drives it is, I guess, a bit more interesting, because... You know, we often, one of the things Clayton Christensen set out to try and disprove was what he called the stupid management theory. So the stupid management theory says, you know, massive technological change comes along, you know, CEOs are just like fat cats, you know, sitting on the beach 90% of the time, getting their tans right, and they just don't see it coming, right? That's the stupid management theory. Um, what he says is the reality of disruption is actually very different. The reality of disruption is if you make rational economic decisions as the CEO of a major corporation, disruption is inevitable. 
It's inevitable economic outcome if you make rational decisions. So you actually have to almost act irrationally to prevent disruption as a CEO of a major corporation. Why is that the case? It starts with capital. So the core difference between sustaining and disruptive innovation in terms of cap capital is that um, incumbents are sitting on yield capital. It's like a bank account. And shareholders expect to get a 5% return year on year on year on year. Um, disruptive innovation tends to be invested in by venture capital. They are happy to take a much bigger risk um, over a period of time. So cash flow is the key difference as a result. So sustaining innovation ex expects a fast and stable payback. Disruptive innovation is prepared to accept um, a slower payback and probably less certain payback, but with ultimately higher returns. So what does that mean in terms of the types of innovation you ultimately do? This chart, I guess, on the, on the right here gives you a bit of a sense of how the mindset works. So the mindset for an incumbent is in that one to three year window. And you can see these two curves, the sustaining innovation curve and the disruptive innovation curve. In that one to three year window, you would do sustaining innovations over disruptive innovations every day of the week because the returns are better in that one to three year window. And that's what they do. They do those sustaining innovations. However, of course, over the seven year horizon, it's different. And here's a classic example. Fairfax, when it was faced with disruption, the first thing it invested in was glossy real estate magazines. Does anyone, it's probably too young an audience to remember this, but I don't know, I remember when real estate ads were tiny little print squares in the back pages of the newspaper, right? No pictures, just print squares. House, 100 grand, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, right? Then they invented this, and then they could charge people like $1,000, $3,000 a page, particularly if it's waterfront. You know, you can buy the whole page for $10,000. Awesome, right? That was the sustaining innovation they did when they started getting in trouble back in 2000. But of course, this thing on the right was actually what was going to kill their business. And this thing on the right back in 2000 was a crappy experience, generated no money. I was working, consulting with Fairfax back in 2009, and even back then, we're speaking to the head of print media, there was no way they wanted to invest in domain as their digital business as much as they were prepared to invest in their print business. Because even in 2009, when 80% of people found their next home online, 80% of the money was still coming out of print classifieds, not digital classifieds. That is disruption writ large. You know you're about to have a big shift when 80% of the consumers are doing one thing, but 80% of the money is coming from somewhere else, right? So that's the process. Um, well, that's the, that's the underlying cause, I guess. It makes a bunch of other things that are very uh, kind of classic markers of disruption. So incumbents much prefer to spend a big CapEx budget. You know, Fairfax spent $100 million on City Search and then sold it for $30 million. Um, these guys raised maybe two or three million, and they ultimately beat Fairfax. So startups inherently are capital scarce. Incumbents are happy to do big capex, but incumbents hate opex. Like, just don't increase my ongoing expenditure, right? The revenue impact. Again, uh, incumbents want look for additive revenue. They hate cannibalizing revenue. Um, Value proposition, and this goes back to what we talked about before, incumbents are looking to find products that are for their best customers to get a better price um, with a superior product, okay? Disruptors are interested in low-end, sometimes inferior products, but that are good enough for the people who currently don't have access to it at all. Um, and I guess the other thing that also then tends to follow these two, that tends to be different on either side of the ledger, is processes and systems which are important as well. So business case planning in a sustaining innovation in an incumbent tends to be predictable business case planning. Waterfall development cycles, right? Tell me what the requirements are and then I'll build to it. Whereas if you go into a startup, it's all how do I build for the unpredictable? How do I build for a set of user experiences that I don't even know what they want? I'll do it with Agile, right? Similarly, in terms of structure and remuneration, um, it'll tend to be a hierarchical structure, whereas in a Startup, it'll be a flat structure. Um, incumbents have legacy technology. Startups are starting with Greenfield, and that gives them the opportunity. So these are all the things that kind of embed 
disruption. That, those things that sit under sustaining are all those things that sit inside an incumbent and make disruption kind of an inevitability, okay? And they all start from capital. Because you've got conservative capital, you hire conservative managers and you get those, con and those conservative managers want to put in place stable structures that are very hierarchical and they want to employ people who are stable, predictable people. They're all the things that, from our perspective, when we're looking at startups, uh, basically we're allergic to. Like, they're toxic, okay? But they all start from that capital preference. I need a 5% return year on year. Um, so what can you do about it? There's two things you can do about it. So one of them is structural, and then the, the next is strategic. So in terms of structural, Christensen talks about thinking about those two things, organizational values, and when we talk about values, it's what we were talking about before, you know, capital values, like, and there are a whole bunch of things that play out in that regard. If you think about a, a, you know, a senior executive at Westpac, they're sitting on $5 billion of bounce of profit a year. They're told they need to grow it by five, by, let's say they're told to grow it by 10%, okay? I need to find 500 million next year. Um, as a CEO, that means all my executives need to go and find you know, 100 million each, okay? And then some startup kid comes and says, hey, I've got this thing, it's only going to take a million dollars, it might get to, you know, a million dollars of revenue next year. That's fascinating, but I've got to get 100 million dollars of new money next year. I have no interest in your startup whatsoever. Does that make sense? And that's the way it plays out in incumbents day in, day out. No interest in anything that small. So that's what values is all about. That's, that's the kind of the core of, a good, values, a good values fit for a, an, an incumbent is typically big dollars, right? Whereas poor values fit is small dollars, not interested. Um, and then on the other side, we've got systems and processes we, we talked about, structures, um, technology, et cetera, et cetera. So typically it talks about, you know, if you've got a good fit in terms of values, then you can probably use an internal team. And it'll either be a lightweight team if there's a good fit in terms of values and processes, or a heavyweight team with all the relevant functions on board if it's a poor fit in terms of processes but a good fit in terms of values. Over on the right-hand side, you've got something where the values don't even fit, like this is a disruptive thing. And in that case, if it's a poor processes and values fit, then it needs to be completely external. If it's a, a good... Um, a if it's a poor values fit but a good processes fit, then you can start internal, but you'll need to spin it out over time. So let me just give some quick practical examples, conscious of time. So here's one that NAB did. So again, it was actually, if you think about Ubank, it's fundamentally, it was digital banking. We were all doing online banking at the time, but they wanted to make a really clean, pure online banking experience. Um, wasn't a good fit from a process point of view. They wanted to break the processes and do something new. So they gave it a lot of autonomy, but fundamentally it was an internal organization. Sits on NAB's balance sheet, uses NAB's risk controls, etc., etc. So a lot of everything there comes from NAB. A different version was News Corp with realestate.com. That was everything different, different values. Like this thing is. Um, going to be producing small dollars in the early days, not interested. So that was an external investment. And this is probably the best example of a disruption hedge in Australian history. Okay? News Corp bought 20% of realestate.com in 2000 for $2 million. So the company was valued at $10 million in 2000. Today, realestate.com is worth $10 billion. They own 60% of it because they put advertising, etc., into it. They never took control of it, so they never killed the, um, the management's kind of different style and culture and everything, and they never stifled it from getting other external capital. So it was the best hedge against disruption that you will see in basically Australian corporate history. Um, another good hedge, probably not quite as good, but still a pretty good one. Actually, maybe you could argue it's better. Um, and so this was where there was actually a good fit in terms of processes, but the values fit was wrong. And so they actually had to spin it out again as an entirely separate venture. They gave it its own company. You'll remember if in the early days of Jetstar, you couldn't even go to the same terminal to get on the planes, right? Because they, they couldn't share Qantas's agreements. So they gave it a completely separate entity. Um, and 
that again was a good hedge against disruption. Two of probably the only two good hedges against disruption in Australian corporate history. Um, the next thing to think about, just briefly, is strategy. So, you know, in terms of the three different things you can do, if you see disruption coming, so one is you need to try and own the core disruptors, okay? That's what we saw with news.com. It's what we saw with Qantas there. So there are two approaches. Here's another approach that Facebook uses. Now, Facebook can just do straight-up acquisition. The reason is Facebook's growing like that. The companies that acquires are growing like that. It can kind of buy them late in the day, and it'll still hold the values, right? Um, the next thing you may want to do is disrupt geographically, and that's what someone like ING's done. So when banking gets difficult, go into other markets, okay? And it's gone into other markets with its ING Direct brand. Um, the third thing you can do is dis go into other industries that actually have nothing to do with your existing business. There's a really fascinating case study here with Kodak and Fuji. So they were direct competitors in the 2000s, okay? Kodak decided they went all off-site, they did a great off-site, they got a great new vision, they said, we need to stop thinking of ourselves as a camera and film company and start thinking of ourselves as an imaging company. We're just about imaging. And so they bought Ophoto, they tried to bring out a whole bunch of new products. But if you think about imaging today, imaging is just a feature in anything and everything. Like imaging just turned into marbles running under a barn door and there was no way they could hold on to it. And so Kodak today are broke. Fuji... Japanese company, probably didn't go on an offsite at all, I have no idea. But they basically sat there and said, wow, this market's disappearing under our feet. What are we good at? We're good at chemicals, we're good at micro technology, we're good at microfilm technology. Let's get into those industries. So they make the film on LCD TV screens, they make face care products, they make pharmaceuticals. They're in all sorts of industries that were related to their capabilities when their industry was being disruption. And they are bigger than they were when they were a film and camera company. So it's a remarkable sort of sliding doors experience between Kodak and Fuji. So disrupting adjacencies is therefore a key part of the sort of strategic response to disruption. So how do we bring those two things, structure and strategy, together in reInventure? So one is committed capital. As I said, the capital is the biggest problem. You know, one of the best things that happened at Westpac was when the, the chief operating officer, who happens to be our investment committee chair, said, you know, I've, I've written that $50 million off. No one expects you to get the money back. Right? And we're like, yes. Because as soon as he said that, we knew that that capital was no longer being treated as yield capital. It was now effectively free capital that could be growth capital. Does that make sense? Second thing is time horizon. We actually are going to be there longer than anyone else. We don't, we're we on, centred on a carried interest like any other VC is, and we don't see it for seven to ten years, which is excruciating, but very true to the principle of the whole thing. So we're thinking about a seven-year to ten-year horizon. We've got a very small, nimble team, and we can make decisions fast, so we can make any investment we want under a million dollars without any recourse to Westpac. Over a million dollars, they have a right of veto. Um, and then independence. So we sit on the boards. And that's important because, you know, when Westpac turns around and says, actually, we like that, we want it to be exclusive to us, we sit there and go, hmm, that's not going to work for the company. So the key thing with most, key problem with most corporate venturing is that they make an investment and then they subsume the startup's interests to the corporate's interests. Everything you do now just needs to be about us, right? We get on the boards and we're totally focused because we're on a carried interest return. We're totally focused on the startup's interest. What can we do to get a great exit here, right? So it's an important thing in terms of the fund structure. Then in terms of strategy, we do all those three things we talked about before. So we've invested in disruptors. So Society One, Assembly Payments, Valiant, which is an SME finance marketplace. Um, other disruptors we see are those, this is the more fundamental disruption we see going into financial services, which is companies that are owning the point of transaction. So, you know, things you'd be familiar with like Afterpay, you know, it's there when you need it. That's disruptive when you're actually making a purchase. Flare is there as an, an HR platform because it's there when people are coming onto a new job and they find out what super they want to roll their super into. That's a key moment and it's important to be there when that's happening. Similarly, Open Agent is, is in the real estate space and again, there when people are making choices about what they want from mortgage. We're disrupting geographic, we're invested in geographical disruptors. So Coinbase we invested in back in 2014. 
there's a whole other conversation we could have about blockchain. We won't have now. Um, and, and we also just invest in adjacencies. We see data as probably the biggest adjacency to banking. Data Republic is a platform for privacy compliant and secure data sharing. Hyperana is AI, which sits on top of data. We invest in other uh, sort of modules in the stack, things like Indebted um, and Consata. Indebted is debt collection, Consata is security, all of which are kind of core banking elements. And then how do we fit in with the whole Westpac machine? We're basically filling that Horizon 3 pot with options. We're creating options for, for, for Westpac. The next stage, business development and M&A at Westpac can take those options by investing themselves and partnering deeply, which they've done with a couple of our ventures, assembly payments particularly. Um, and all the meanwhile, Westpac is focused on Horizon 1, trying to improve its core business. That is the process. A uh, long way to get there, but that's how we think about disruption and the response to disruption. So. Thank you. So do you want to grab, yeah, the, okay. grab the end one? So Simon's going to stay with us for the panel, but I'd also like to introduce our other two panellists now um, to <laughs> put some of this in, in context. So first up is Rakhne Gandhi, who is an expert in strategy, customer-centric design and digital innovation with a wealth of experience in delivering transformation. Uh, she's currently the Executive General Manager of Customer Strategy and Digital at Suncorp and brings to bear her extensive background in digital transformation and customer centricity to, as well as commercially-minded cultures to spearhead change at Suncorp. Uh, Ragna was previously the CEO of the flagship uh, New South Wales Government Agency Service New South Wales. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about that experience too. In this role, she transformed the customer experience of government through the implementation of a pioneering digital-first one-stop shop model. Uh, this model became a domestic and international case study for successful delivery of service transformation. Um, Ragna, if you want to just come and take the seat next to Simon. And joining us as well, thank you is Rocky Scopoliti, have I got that right? Fantastic. Is a world-renowned futurologist and director of the Centre for Industry 4.0. His pioneering research on the confluence of demographic change associated with millennials and digital technology have influenced how we think about social, cultural, economic and technological futures. His new book, uh, Youthquake 4.0, A Whole Generation and the New Industrial Revolution, will be out next month. I'm sure that's going to be a very interesting read. Uh, Rocky is a media commentator and he's an acclaimed speaker locally and internationally. He's on. He's been on 150 boards and leadership teams, including for <laughs> and presented to. Well, there you go, presented to, and hopefully inform them on some of the things we're talking about this afternoon. He's published 12 research report, uh, reports, which have become internationally recognised, uh, and uh, he sits on the Optus business leadership team within his current role. So please join me Thank in welcoming you. Rocky to Thank stage you. as well. Thank you. So I thought to kind of bring this into some of the themes that we are all talking about in the context of the uh, Adobe Symposium, at, well, in particular, 4.0, we've all been talking about the industrial revolution that we're facing now. I thought a good place to start is actually get Rocky to talk to us and set a little bit of scene and context on the appetite and readiness of Australian organisations for disruptive in, uh, innovation, such as what Simon's been referring to in his presentation, especially in light of this fourth industrial revolution. So so could you share a few thoughts just to get us going yeah, on, on that? Yeah, thanks, Nadia. Look, um, it's interesting when you look at Australia, I guess, in a global context. According to the World Economic Forum, Australia ranks 15th uh, in terms of our future of production readiness. Uh, and in fact, we rank 11th in the world when it comes to technology and innovation. And we rank ninth in the world when it comes to human capital or our skill base. So we've got the ingredients and the competencies uh, that are world class, uh, that, are, that are viewed as being world class. Um, and we're now on the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution, which is about to unfold the next evolution of uh, digital innovation, and this is going to come on to us at speed, scale and impact like never before. 
Um, and so what's important here is to think about some of these enabling technologies, and you would have heard about many of them, such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, the Internet of Things, all of these kinds of technologies are what make up the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the other really important development that's on our uh, doorstep is 5G. And we can't think about 5G as just faster mobile. This is 1,000 times faster than the 4G smartphones uh, networks that you're using today. Now, the reason why I mention that is because whenever something is 1,000 times faster, you are going to get behavioural change. And so it's really important then to sort of, for us to find out how ready Australia is for this next industrial revolution. And so the research that we've got underway at the moment is showing us some promises, but equally some very uh, uh, concerning areas um, and I'd say that our risk appetite uh, to innovation is probably the single most important uh, area that we're going to have to address. So the research is sort of indicating that one in two executives in Australia um, are reporting back to us that um, they see innovation and risk-taking as being a career-limiting move. Um, and so in that climate, um, you know, are we really set up, uh, are our organisations really set up to open themselves up to all of the opportunities that this next industrial revolution has to offer. And I think yeah. Simon did a terrific job on sort of showing the differences between you know, of approaches that, uh, that enterprises have got. And so there's never been a more important time um, because the reality is, is that the fourth industrial revolution is going to come onto our shores uh, from forces outside of our country um, and so the things that we've been able to find shelter uh, within Australia in terms of the third industrial revolution, those protection areas may not necessarily be there when, uh, when this next one comes upon us. Mm. So, of course, the big question then becomes how do you balance the risk-taking and building that appetite for risk-taking and a cultural uh, appetite for risk awareness in a large organisation to even make this sort of thing happen. Can you? Can you even do that in an existing organisation? I think there's examples of, uh, I think, as uh, Simon mentioned before, about where organisations are trying to go through a cultural transformation, which I think is really... We, we tend to sort of think about transformation as though it's something that we've got to do technically. <laughs> um, what is separating organisations apart from their peers uh, when it comes to those organisations who are successfully transforming is the cultural transforma transformation that they're gone through first. Um, and I think we can see evidence of that, of what um, is going on with ANZ at the moment. Um, and it's widely reported in terms of the, the cultural transformation to a more agile workforce, which is what the priority of that organisation is. So I think, you know, when we think about um, transformation, we've got to think about it as something beyond just uh, technology. It is the culture that will foster uh, the appetite for innovation within the um, different enterprises. And I think a portfolio approach, you see different organisations that are doing things inside their, uh, their operations and then outside their, their operations as well. Mm. Um, Rachna, can you share what disruptive innovation looks like at Suncorp? So give us, obviously this is a, a legacy business, it's been around a long time, um, and it has been reported that there's clearly a lot of change going on in terms of the way Suncorp is endeavouring to go to market. Can you share a little bit about what that experience has been like for you coming into the organisation and what disruptive innovation means in the context of the business? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, you know, um, Simon touched on some really important points uh, the only context I'd bring to it is um, organizations, it, it kind of depends on where you're on, on the journey, right? So um, disruptive innovation in its classical sense, in terms of you know what you shared in terms of best practice, where companies have managed to crack it at that, um, you know, spin out, completely new, completely disrupted, uh, the organization or the industry, um, is one end of the spectrum. And very, very few organizations will pull that off, quite frankly. There'll be very few organizations that are prepared for it, are consciously aware, not in denial, etc. 
I think there are steps large corporates, particularly legacy corporates, need to take to start heading in that direction. So ideal case would be that you completely recognize it, you know, you invest in the spin out, uh, you do it in a manner that really incubates um, what you're spinning out from a cultural perspective, from a um, you know, business setup perspective, etc. My experience, even in the time that I was at Service New South Wales, which was a startup in government and was a spin out, very different financial context, but nevertheless, is it's really hard for organizations to get there. And that the maturity from an uh, um, independence perspective, or understanding perspective of what it's going to take to actually get that sort of a spin out to work. Uh, and sustain itself, because you, you might get it to work, it might work for a couple of years, but to sustain, to grow and become an established business is limited in terms of that intellect and that maturity existing. So I think what Suncorp's doing, which I think is a good start for a lot of large corporates, is thinking about you know, how you take a bifocal view. You know, how do you actually start to build a culture which is capable of looking at the near and the far at the same time? Uh, the far might not completely be Horizon 3, but you're starting to look at, you have to protect the core business. Um, you do have to grow the core business because the environment we are in um, requires that. The analysts judge you for it. Uh, you know, the stakeholder groups judge you for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no escaping that. You know, I, I mentioned a recent example. Um, there's a Financial Times article on the insurance business um, in the UK. And there's a whole lot of organizations, insurance businesses particularly, trying... Uh, very innovative things um, in terms of disrupting their business model and are getting really penalized by the analyst community in terms of making those efforts. So you can't shy away from that. I think it's a, it's a balance of saying you do have to continue to show performance, growth, etc. But how do you also start looking at that bifocal view of what's coming in the distance and building the ability in the organization to stretch to that? Um, We've decided to play in the adjacency space. We've decided that that's the space we want to look at disruption uh, or transformation, uh, quite uh, dramatic transformation in. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. You know, there's some really good insight around why do customers um, insure? It's about risk protection. But what are all sorts of things in the ecosystem that would reduce risk? Um, also because we're quite conscious of the fact that um, a lot of the solutions that customers will ultimately move to won't come from your Im immediate competitor set in a truly disruptive environment. They'll actually come from completely unexpected providers of that service. So one way to sort of circumvent that is to start to think in that space. So I'd say that, you know, have we taken the tact of let's, you know, spin something out, incubate, grow? No. Uh, but we are starting, or what we have done, is start to look at how do you start to bring a culture of that bifocal thinking into the organization? What is that space? Because you could go into so many different places for disruption. What is that space we want to play in? And starting to put some conscious effort, uh, investment, KPIs, uh, and um, commitment around growing that. Mm. So what, what do KPIs and metrics actually look like in that circumstance? Because clearly mm. um, Simon was touching on the fact that capital, for example, it's a complete reversal of an understanding of what capital is in order yeah. to allow something to kind of flourish and, and hit the unpredictable and, uh, you know, experiment mm. and so on. So can you put KPIs and measurements around this and, and how different are they? I think they're dramatically different. And, you know, I think I liked what Simon shared there about... Um, and cap it does the capital is at the heart of it, frankly, because it is just so contrary. Um, anything you do in that innovation disruptive space is just so contrary to how large legacy businesses have functioned. You know, it's literally turning it upside down in its head and saying, you're going to have to invest heavily. It's not even peripheral. Um, you're going to have to give it time, not a one-year return on investment. Um, the return will be in a different form than your investment profile. It is so contrary to the DNA, it's mm. not funny. I, I think that's the biggest challenge, really. It's, it's not so much attracting the talent, because um, I think you, 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 there is a, a growing segment of individuals um, who don't see it as unattractive to be in that, uh, you know, to try and drive this change in large corporates. You know, it, it is an attractive space to be in. I think the biggest shift is that cultural shift of saying, a longer horizon for return, 
that we are going to front up the market and talk about it and say, yes, we're consciously doing this and there isn't going to be a return for the next five years, um, that's a big Big change. I can't help but think this is going to be a completely different type of CEO that's going to be presenting to these, uh, you know, to the analysts and the financial advisors on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Simon, just based on that, on what Ruckner's been talking about there and, and your examples there, I mean, how do you see the readiness of Australian organisations for this kind of disruption right now, given we're faced with the fourth industrial revolution? Um, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Sorry. I think it's... Um, I think probably not ready, would be the fair assessment. Um, you know, I, I actually find th it's such an interesting debate to me, the culture one. You know, I think the culture one is a really fascinating question. And I, I should, uh, you know, a bit of my background prior to sort of working with companies around disruption and so on, um, I spent a little bit of time in an innovation company called What If, which came out mm -hmm. of the UK, and it was a little bit like IDEO, but it was much more from a product perspective. And I was a big believer in the power of culture to, to create change. Um, and I have to say that my journey since then has been slight moderation, if not sort of, I'm now the kind of disappointed idealist at some <laughs> level <laughs> in terms of the power of culture. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because if you look at the companies that have actually managed to sidestep a major disruption... For most of them that I see, it, it hasn't been culture that's done it. You know, I think ANZ is a fascinating example because if you think about it, ANZ, you know, under John McFarlane had an absolutely transformative culture. Yeah. Then we had a new CEO who, took, who was basically like took it back, back to where it was <laughs> in terms of culture and now we've got the disruptive culture again. But actually it's just kind of shifted the deck chairs. Like mm. nothing fundamentally has changed in terms of... Like we haven't seen remarkable growth or transformation into new industries, etc. I mean, yep. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of change going on internally. But, you know, my, it's, again, an example of raising the question, can culture really make a difference? And, you know, if you look at some of the bigger transformations, they've actually been where, and Christensen talks about this, of, you know, founder CEOs have an inordinate ability to create change in a way that, Hired CEOs almost never do. Mm. So if you think about a Steve Jobs... Now, uh, Apple was worth almost next to nothing. It was almost on the edge of going into bankruptcy when it decided to release the iPod. But it was a complete bet-the-company move, right? And it was only a founder who could bet the company on that move. Similarly, another big transformation is Netflix. You know, they were, had a massive business sending DVDs to people in the post. And it was a massive bet the company move where he literally split mm. the company into two companies, did one that was online, entirely separate, and one that was DVD. Okay. Um, and similarly, and this is, I think, a really interesting example. You see the, the example of, say, a, um, a Jeff Bezos, right, with um, Amazon. Now, AWS, I mean, I think uh, last year, Amazon had something like 30% growth in revenue, which is crazy. I mean, that's like startup style growth. Right? It's unbelievable for a company that's a half a trillion dollar company. Anyway, but you know, that is, I think, an interesting company because Bezos manages, I mean, from all accounts, if you've ever read accounts of Bezos, he's a total dictator. I mean, in terms of like empowering cultures, you're kidding me? That guy's like, like uh, you know. Um, but he, he actually has created a version of an empowering culture just through structure. So uh, some of you may have come across, he sent an email and it was famously published by a Google engineer who was critiquing Google at the time. Um, he sent an email to all his devs basically saying, if I see any of you in different pods talking to each other instead of documenting your code properly so that it can actually interact without you talking, I'll fire you, right? So he implemented this hardcore um, version of autonomous entities running around making independent decisions and growing with autonomy. And he did it in a classically autocratic, dictatorial <laughs> way. So this crazy... And, and the thing that's interesting about Amazon is therefore you've got these innovative units that are doing things at a micro level, and that's great usually for sustaining innovation, but is not great for disruptive innovation. But not only have you got people who are prepared to take risks at that level, but you've then got him and people at that level being prepared to say, we're going to make a massive bet on the cloud mm. and set up AWS, right? So you actually need 
that risk-taking behavior at every level of the business. It's not enough to go, I want my people to take risk, but I'm going to sit at the top as a CEO and not and bet not the company on, everything, on anything, mm. right? And the reality is most hired CEOs actually operate in a very small window of degrees of freedom. Like, mm. they just they actually can't do much. Mm. I think th that bit, sorry, just to add, I would absolutely agree with. I think, you know, we, we did, um, McKinsey did a case study um, on Service New South Wales because it's doubted as uh, one of the successful transformations in government globally. Um, and I would absolutely agree when we unpacked it, um, and this is obviously uh, broader than that particular example, but... In terms of founding CEO versus hired CEO, I completely agree. I think there is an aspect of um, a startup of actually owning the success and the development, the growth, the future of that organization that drives a very, very, very different decision-making uh, setup um, than not being in that case. And I, I do think the environment contributes to it because of how hired CEOs are judged. Right, they are judged based on annual performance, yep. um, short-termism, etc. So I think we can't really discount that component if that drives a certain kind of behavior. The difference, um, I think, with a, a founding CEO and uh, what leadership they bring to it is what the success factors are. We went through a process um, at Service New South Wales of sort of making sure that the broader culture would not... Uh, or the broader ecosystem would not destroy what we had built as a little incubated startup for four years, like we were fiercely protecting, uh, you know, a child. Like literally, I would use that analogy. The amount of passion that was invested in saying that uh, the broader ecosystem is different to what we've incubated and we have to protect it was extraordinary. But I think the culture factor for me still stands because um, the other contributing factor that then sustained that uh, incubated startup to grow into something bigger, withstand its ecosystem, which is completely different to it, um, and continue to generate the positivity and the positive impact it was having was culture. Mm -hmm. So when we unpacked it, yes, it was a digital transformation. It was a startup. It completely transformed how government delivers services, etc. But what enabled us to pull it off in an environment that was so different to where we um, came out from. Came out <laughs> from was the culture, and maybe it's how we're describing it. But building risk appetite everywhere in your organisation is culture. You know, is being able to embed yeah. that. I, I that don't is. Mm. I do think. I mean, government Sorry. is different because <laughs> it doesn't yeah, operate under, under the same capital constraints. Although interestingly, that private industry um, does. Yeah, Rodney said that she was surprised in our previous conversation, surprised yeah. at the similarities between yeah, public right. and private. Other than that bit, I don't disagree. I think you yeah. know when we talked about it as well. I think. The capital bit, like I said, is goes to the heart of the matter yeah. uh, in the private sector. But I was amazing. I was surprised having gone from the private sector to public to do this transformation, come back into the private sector, uh, of how many commonalities there are yeah. actually, because uh, it, the resistance comes under different labels. You know, the the, the yeah. uh, push to not. Uh, accept change, you know, the push to accept the status quo and no change is required. Um, the sort of steps you talked about, you know, in terms of uh, the ways of working, agile versus, uh, you know, a more structured waterfall, the governance layers, the expectations, they might come under different labels, but they're all there. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing the best, you know, so the case study uh, with McKinsey, what we found is all the best practice transformations, like serious transformations they found globally, in government said the same thing, that actually it was not that different mm. um, to the private sector, uh, other yeah. than the expectation around um, the return. It's, a, it's yeah. a bizarre thing, government, because you actually have this weird phenomenon where it, the, the boss, the, the people at the top in terms of the politicians are actually, I mean, the closest thing to an entrepreneur that you'll find in many cases um, you know, in government, mm -hmm. right? They yes, are, true. They, they, they're off, I mean, particularly the more radical ones. Yeah. You know, they're kind of self-made. <laughs> they they mm. got there through their own. Yes. And, and a lot of them go in with a massive change agenda. And actually, the resistance is actually at the next layer down. It is, Where you've yeah. got department heads right. who are enforcing conservatism yep. Yep. and stability. It's I think we're talking though, about right? Turnbull right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we're having a bit of a conversation about our own Prime Minister. Rocky, you were going to make yeah, a Yeah, if, if we just pick up on this word survival, it's just, um, mm -hmm. I think it's an important... Uh, 
um, word to contextualise in terms of time. So if you look at the average life of a Fortune 500 organisation in 1920, it was 65 years. The average life of a Fortune 500 company today is 15 mm. years. And it's predicted to decline down to 10 uh, within the next five or seven years. Um, and so I think if you think about uh, a CEO coming into an organisation, um, you know, in many respects, the strategy that, uh, that the CEO and the board um, must develop and execute has to be mindful that they're operating in a time period which is fundamentally different to anything that they've operated in before in the mm -hmm. past. And so, um, so, and I think this is, a, again, important in terms of speed, scale and impact, uh, that what we're about to go into is an environment where those three dimensions are going to come at legacy organisations like never mm. before. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a state that I refer to as juvenescence. I'm, I'm not sure. Has anyone heard of that word, juvenescence? Has anyone heard of that word? I don't no? know, but I'm going to use that at a, a drinks party next it time. Means, <laughs> it's, it's my 2017 word of the year, and it means the state of youthfulness, and I apply it in an enterprise state. And what that means is that enterprises culturally have to get to a state where they're constantly in beta, constantly evolving, uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's where they play a, a fundamental role in um, preparing themselves um, to survive uh, in the environment that they're going into. Um, the other thing that I'd say is that if you look at uh, exponential organisations, and they're defined by the Singularity University as those organisations who uh, outcompete uh, their, their peers or industries by multiples or factors of 10 or more, they can achieve what I refer to as a new economic physics, and this is where the marginal cost of acquisition or supply uh, becomes virtually zero. Uh, and that's because these businesses are platform-based, data-intensive, yeah. capital light. Uh, so they can out-economically perform once they hit these sort of performance curves or what Kurzweil refers to as the, the law of accelerated mm -hmm. returns. It makes, once they hit that curve, it's very difficult for a legacy model to catch them. Uh, and so again, coming back to the point here is that there is a time imperative at an industry level or at a participant level to uh, transform before those curves kick in because otherwise it's gonna be very costly or very difficult to try and catch those kinds of competitors. Mm. Can I just throw that to you, Simon, those, those comments there? I, I mean, how it's... Do you agree with that? And and this and and I want to I want to ask you about the force of the industrial revolution too, because when we've talked about this in the past, um, your suggestion is that perhaps this is iterative. It's not necessarily the revolution we think it is. But I'm oh, just I'm no, curious. No, I do think it's a revolution. I do, but I I think it's a I think this is a 50 year revolution. Like I mean, this started <laughs> in the 70s with the piece. With, with, I mean, it started with IBM mainframes. Like this is the computer. Rev this mm. is still the computer revolution. It's just become more and more micro, and it's computer and communications plugged together, and it's um, and it's a fifty to a hundred year transformation, mm -hmm. um, and it ex is experienced in waves of transformation. So you know we had that sort of computer wave, and now we've got the internet wave, and within the internet we had the music wave, and then we had the media wave, <laughs> and then we're having the fintech wave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's waves in waves in waves, right? Um, yeah, so I do think there is a I do think there is a transformation, but I think it's a I think this is a fifty year transformation that mm -hmm. we're going through. Um, but uh, I would say, in, in terms of that, I mean, the interesting thing about you know, I mean, we spend all of our time looking for businesses as a VC that have winner takes all economics. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's <laughs> the thing we look for. Um, and the trouble is, the way the game is played in VC now, uh, most of those that <coughs> there's kind of two layers, there's typically like the consumer or the, these kind of platform layers and a lot of them operate at the consumer level. And they are being played out on a global stage and what you have is these giant venture funds. I mean, SoftBank now has a $100 billion venture fund. I mean, I don't know where to start with that, right? <laughs> so 
you've got these giant venture firms and what they do is they see opportunities that are kind of next generation opportunities. Let's take, for example, things like Uber and let's say Deliveroo and Foodora, right? So Deliveroo and Foodora, same opportunity. They both see it. Two VC funds are basically arch enemies. They know this is a winner takes all opportunity. They both stuff as much cash into these businesses as they can and say grow <laughs> globally as fast as you can. That's the way the game is played, mm -hmm. right? And in that context, it's very hard for Australia with, you know, maybe $3 billion capital in VC total to even start to compete. So the biggest risk is that a lot of these industries are just completely globalising, right? I mean, if you look at what has happened to, you know, Fairfax and Channel 9 just merged, that's like, oh, oh you know, there's not much left of either of our businesses, we might as well put them together. Um, <laughs> you know... That, like, that's our <coughs> media industry is gone. Mm -hmm. like, let's be honest. It's <coughs> gone. It's 90% gone. 90% of our media industry is now owned by Facebook and Google, mm. right? Um, and <laughs> they are global plays. The exact same thing is very likely to happen to our financial services industry. Like, if you want to see a big finance company, go to China. Mm. Um, you've, got Anfi An you've got Alibaba, which is now a half a trillion dollar company. You've got Tencent, a half a trillion dollar company, battling it out with Apple, with you know, Google, these, these half trillion dollar companies out there, mm. they've both got financial services in their sites. The, you, you know, the Chinese ones wrote the playbook. So Alibaba set up Ant Financial, which is the largest financial services company, the fastest growing financial mm. services company you've ever seen in your <laughs> life. Um, and they are both going for it. And for them, it's just another revenue stream. They just little. I mean, financial services would just be collateral damage potentially on the way mm. for those guys. Do you know what I mean? They mm. are, they are giants going after this industry as an extra a, a revenue growth stream. Yeah, I think there is a learning there as well <coughs> because, um, and Christensen ta talks about this as well. Is you have to be careful when you're looking at you know um, disruptors that have succeeded in terms of what you're taking away with it because the context plays an important part as well. So, you know, we did a lot of work when we started looking at adjacencies. I spent a lot of time talking to Penang in China. There's characteristics of that market um, in China that have contributed to Alibaba and, and, and Penang, et cetera, that we cannot replicate here. So you, you do have, you know, is the market um, uh, growing? Is, this, is scale really easy, right? In Australia, scale's not easy. In China, in India... In Asian countries, scale's really easy. So you ca you have to when you're looking at these, it's you have to be careful not to go for the outliers, and you know that's the status of um, where to learn from and to bring back. Mm. Um, you've also got to put into context of what what is the geographic economic environment in which you're trying to disrupt, or the disruption will occur in terms of your industry. I think. Uh, financial services and insurance, or financial services banking insurance in Australia, has been protected by that by long, mm -hmm. for a long time. Yeah, you know, it's been circumstantial to a large degree. It's been the market that we operate in, uh, the role uh, regulation and government has played. There's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of factors which are lifting, and which is why well, that's the, that that's will the change. Because yeah. mm -hmm. what we're seeing now is regulatory arbitrage. Yes, yeah. where basically countries are having to compete on yeah. the basis of regulation Spot to on. get mm -hmm. people starting up in there. Yeah. and country. I want to throw that to Rocky, and yeah. then I'm going to throw it to <laughs> questions if there are any, because I am conscious of our yeah. time. So if you get your questions ready, people. So. I, Rocky. I, I think the discussion around China is really important because um, uh, we now know what can happen um, when you start seeing explosive rise of middle class, mm. when you see scale. Um, you know, uh, the, the middle class in China is now 400 million. Uh, just in millennials alone, there's 415 million. Mm. Um, but you know what? We've got the Philippines, we've got Indonesia, we've got so many other uh, developing countries on our doorstep. Um, and now the other really interesting thing also when you think about the developing markets that are on our doorstep is over the coming years, there's an anticipated 2 billion other people who are going to become connected. So if you think about disruption as we've understood it today, uh, with the, you know, the billions of people that are connected, imagine what it's going to be like with another two billion connected. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these countries like Indonesia 
are now starting to really foster innovation out of a lot of the uh, uh, you know developing communities uh, that they have. The Philippines and uh, is, is another example of that. Now, wh why am I saying this? I'm saying this because this is on our doorstep, um, and just like Ant Financial will find its way down here. Mm -hmm. And financial, I was explaining this to uh, Simon before we started, Australia is not even a rounding error mm. in the way they think, right? We do, we, 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 we're just, you know, uh, you know, a side effect of what they choose to do in their core markets. And so I think that's where some of our industries probably need to pay attention because it may not, we may not necessarily be in the primary line of sight, uh, but we may be impacted as a result of, of something, the, yeah. s of some fallout uh, that's 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 occurring <laughs> might, just on our doorstep. They might just kind of turn to the right and just take us out. <laughs> yeah, elbow that's, by that's right. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, is that your industry? I just uh, cast. That's right. <laughs> Flick of a finger. Everyone, please join me in thanking our. Um,